Ah, who's next? <sighs> oh, party people in the place to be. What's going on? It's me. It's me. I kind of wanted to wrap things up in uh, this particular session. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to watch this because I still have more drink and because I really want to watch this one. So I'm going to watch it with you. This is from What Culture WWE. Uh, I like their stuff, and I haven't gotten a chance to review any of their stuff, so we're going to do it right here. How WWE should have booked Goldberg starts right now. Goldberg. Go. Yeah, we're looking at Goldberg. <laughs> I was never a WCW guy. I was a WWF through and through. But I remember there, watching I'm all. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com, and welcome to how WWE should have booked. Right, look back at infamous WWE missed booking opportunities and talk about how I would book them differently because I'm a smart ass. I like most of this his. This week uh, we're going to look at Goldberg. Go. Yeah, we're looking at Goldberg. What happened in WWE in 2003 where they hired Goldberg? He came in and destroyed everyone, including The Rock, Chris Jericho, Three Minute Warning, Lance Storm, Christian. Uh, so basically, he went on a mini undefeated streak uh, until SummerSlam, where he was beaten in an Elimination Chamber match by Triple H, despite annihilating everyone else in the match. Then at Unforgiven, he beat Triple H for the championship, so, uh, retained it at Survivor Series, and then lost it at Armageddon in a triple threat match. He lost the Royal Rumble match because of Brock Lesnar, speared Brock Lesnar at No Way Out, and then fought him at WrestleMania in one of the worst WrestleMania matches of all time, with the entirety of Madison Square Garden booing the two men out the building because both men were leaving the company the next night. Oh dear. Goldberg had one year in the company and it was sort of disappointing because, well first of all they just tried to rehash his undefeated streak, you know the whole who is next thing, and then that annoyed people, and then he was handed a bunch of losses, which annoyed everyone else. It was almost the same way yeah, too. yeah, it petered out with one of the worst matches in WrestleMania history. Because so, the WCW oops, that he ran through do it better. was built as kind of a weak company so, and he came through and ran through a very weak Goldberg, You have to look at what he's good at. And what's he good at? He's good at brief bursts of power. He's good mm -hmm. at spearing people. He's good mm -hmm. at doing this. Stick your tongue out. And what's he bad at? Well, he's bad at talking, he's bad at wrestling for more than yeah. 10 minutes, and he's bad yeah. at not crippling Bret Hart. <laughs> so we'll have him not do any of those things and we accent the positive. So let's say we book Goldberg for six matches in the WWE. That's all, six. He doesn't do any Raw matches, he's just main events. Because we don't want to overexpose him and have people being bored of him before he actually gets to do some Keep a good note there, work. Though. Six matches, and what's Goldberg's agenda? No His agenda is not championships, he doesn't go after any titles, so Vince doesn't resent this WCW guy coming in. His one goal is to cripple WWE superstars. He's brought in by Eric Bischoff, who is the Raw manager at the time. He's brought in with a secret agenda, kill everyone you can find. And this makes him a heel. Now the thing is, Goldberg wins a lot of matches and he's already, you know, he's just gonna walk into the company and be pushed to the top spot. People are naturally gonna resent him for that, so why not make him heal, grab that heat, and make it nuclear? So, to start with, he debuts after WrestleMania, turns up, uh, after WrestleMania, and spears a top star. But who does he spear? Not The Rock, he spears The Undertaker. He never speaks. He barely speaks at all throughout his entire run. If, if preferably, I would not have Goldberg say one word during his year at the company. He turns up, spears The Undertaker, jackhammer, end of Raw. Then at Backlash, it turns out Undertaker's got broken ribs, but damn it, he wants Goldberg's ass. And the Raw before the pay-per-view, again, Goldberg blindsides The Undertaker. Doesn't talk, just spears him into something horrible. Maybe spears him through a sheet of glass or through like a thin wall, something like that. Anyway, Goldberg attacks Taker before the pay-per-view. So Backlash comes around, Undertaker turns up with his ribs heavily taped, okay? So he is in a bad way, but he's still gonna go on with it because he's the American badass, and Goldberg runs over him, spears him, jackhammers him, one, two, three, and he just turns to the camera and holds up one. 
The next night on Raw, you don't see him. In fact, you don't see him for ages. The commentators are sort of, hey, what's going on? And this starts the period of basically, he turns up, goes after a WWE guy, then disappears for two months. So every two pay-per-views, we have Goldberg. So a few weeks pass and no one knows what's going on. Then in the weeks leading up to Bad Blood, Chris Jericho's in the ring, then suddenly out of nowhere, bang! Boom! Goldberg spears him out of nowhere. He wants Chris Jericho at Bad Blood. And Chris Jericho's like, I want no part of Goldberg, <laughs> okay? I am not next. I remember him from WCW. I don't want this. He goes to Eric Bischoff saying, hey, Bischoff, so I don't want this match at Bad Blood. Can you get me out of it? And Bischoff says, no, I've booked the match. And Chris Jericho says, for God's sake, man, why? And Eric Bischoff says, do you remember 1999? So a bad blood, Jericho is crushed by Goldberg. Goldberg turns to the camera. So now everyone's panicking. Eric Bischoff has set this crazy animal loose in the company and who's next, who's next, who's next? Shawn Michaels turns up just before SummerSlam. He's like, you know what, I'm sick of this. I'm next. I know what Goldberg's up to. He's just trying to cripple WWE guys. Well, I'm Mr. WWE. I never left. Goldberg. Come at me, bro. Eric Bischoff comes out and says, you want Goldberg at SummerSlam? You got it. Turns around, bang! Goldberg, you monster. He looks down at Shawn Michaels, does, ah, da, da. Ah, ah, ah. and then he picks him up and jackhammers him through the announce table. So SummerSlam turns up and again, because of these nagging injuries, Shawn Michaels is again beaten by Goldberg. Spear, jackhammer, one, two, three. Survivor Series is next, and this time Goldberg decides he wants the WWE Champion. Not the Championship, he doesn't care about that belt. In fact, he stamps on the belt, spits on it. If it's not WCW, he doesn't want it. But he wants Brock Lesnar. And that's the thing, you know, people are saying, oh, Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar. No, that was a nightmare match. Well, no, actually, this was the match that everyone wanted until they actually got it because they realized both men were leaving the company and were both, quote, selling out. But if you have it at Survivor Series, neither men are leaving the company, everyone's excited. So Survivor Series, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. It's an absolute slugfest and finally Goldberg manages to pin Brock Lesnar. He's unstoppable. Also later on this same pay-per-view Survivor Series, Goldberg interferes in the Team Bischoff versus Team Austin match. He's the one who interferes, not Batista. He spears Shawn Michaels. And this helps Bischoff banish Austin from the company. So Goldberg is a proper heel now. Him and Bischoff ruling the roost. Then it comes down to the Royal Rumble. Who's next? This time it's Eddie Guerrero's turn. How does this match get set up? Do you remember back in WCW where Eddie Guerrero cut a vicious promo on Bischoff and management and all the things wrong with WCW? Well, we're having another one of those. Eddie Guerrero corners Eric Bischoff and says, you're not gonna do to this company what you did to WCW, slaps Eric Bischoff. And then Eric Bischoff says, okay, fine. Sends a little text, then, Eddie Guerrero is walking down a corridor. We see Goldberg appear behind him. Goldberg runs for him. Eddie Guerrero turns around, smashes him in the head with a chair. Eddie Guerrero trapped him. It's a trap. So then the match is set. Eddie Guerrero versus Goldberg at the Royal Rumble. And beforehand, Brock Lesnar corners Eddie Guerrero and says, what the hell are you doing? If I couldn't beat Goldberg, what the hell chance does a guy like you have? Eddie Guerrero says, hey man, I'm gonna do what you never could and slaps Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar is so at the Royal Rumble, it looks like Eddie Guerrero is going to cheat his way into beating Goldberg. Unfortunately, Brock Lesnar comes out, interferes, Goldberg hits the spear, the jackhammer, one, two, three. So because of Brock Lesnar's interference, Eddie Guerrero and Brock Lesnar, they're set up for no way out. There's no interference from Goldberg this time. Instead, Eddie oh, Guerrero Eddie just Guerrero. cheats yeah, to yeah, win yeah. against Brock Lesnar becoming the WWE Champion. And those two have a rematch at WrestleMania before Brock Lesnar disappears, which would not be a bad match because no one would want Brock Lesnar to win that. They'd want Eddie and they'd be super, super happy for him. So that's what happens with Brock Lesnar and Eddie. Uh, at WrestleMania with Goldberg though, beforehand, uh, Goldberg and Eric Bischoff comes out. Goldberg has not said a single word and Bischoff just says, Goldberg has beaten all of your heroes. Who is left for Goldberg to beat? And then we hear this music. Out comes the Olympic hero, Kurt Angle. He says, buddy, you ain't never beaten me. I am the wrestling machine and I challenge you to a match 
at WrestleMania. Ha. It's the perfect match. The wrestling machine versus the thug. Brute strength versus technical brilliance. And it's an amazing match. Also, you know, people are invested because Kurt Angle's Goldberg not going Kurt anywhere. Angle. The match itself is brilliant. Kurt Angle out wrestles Goldberg, carries him to a brilliant match. If anyone could do it, Kurt Angle can do it. And he forces Goldberg to submit to the ankle lock in the middle of the ring. He taps out, and that is the last we see of Goldberg. So he's had a year in the company. He wrestled six high profile matches. He was a big draw, got a lot of money out of Goldberg, and no one got sick of him. He had a clear agenda all the way through, never muddied his run with any titles. He just went out and did what he did best, which is beat people using ferocious offense and not saying a damn word. And that is how I would book Goldberg in the WWE. Do you disagree? If so, tell me about it in the comments and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And you can even follow me on Twitter here. I'm Adam from WhatCulture.com and I'll see you soon. No Raw matches. Now, the reason why Goldberg was on as many Raws as he was, which was, I think, all of them, was because WWE was fucking desperate for Goldberg to be on their show. You gotta remember, when Goldberg came in, that was in the middle of the reign of fucking terror on Raw, where Triple H buried everybody for no other reason than because he was fucking Stephanie. It was atrocious, and the ratings fucking proved it. It was a boring two hours to try to trudge through, week in and week out. More, oh, more Triple H, oh God. And you could tell that the guys didn't really care as much about what they were doing as they had even a couple of years before. And the roster was severely damaged, it was severely low, as far as as far as talent was concerned, as far as credibility of said talent was concerned, it was extremely low. They brought Goldberg in to try to boost ratings. That's why Goldberg was on as many Raws as he was. I can understand from a creative standpoint trying to keep him off to make him a main attraction, but that was why he was on as many Raws as he was. So I don't believe that at that point they would have continued to not have Goldberg on as many Raws. Especially because with the amount of money that they gave Goldberg in his contract and with the fact that there was another WCW guy coming in that could not have done anything good for the morale of the rest of the locker room. It really couldn't have. So the no Raw matches thing is great on paper, but in practicality, I don't think it would have worked. Making him a heel is a questionable choice because when he first comes in... People are going to want to associate him as a face because I don't remember, I don't know if he was ever a heel in WCW. He probably was. It was fucking WCW. Not that any of that shit mattered. But uh, everybody remembers him as a face. It's kind of like, it's kind of, I won't say Hogan because a lot of people remember him as Hollywood Hogan, but a lot of fans remember him as the red and yellow Hogan. You know what I mean? Like they remember him as the face. So making him a heel would be a hard thing to do. Even associating him with Eric Bischoff doesn't guarantee that a heel is going to get over as a heel because they tried that all the fucking time on Raw. It didn't really work because Eric Bischoff was kind of a weak fucking heel. Really? Like, I didn't give a damn about anything that he did. Now, him spearing The Undertaker is a great start, except in 2003, Undertaker was over on SmackDown. So, you would have to bring Undertaker over to Raw. Or have Goldberg go over to SmackDown, but he couldn't be a component of, you know, the brand split screws this whole thing up on a couple of different levels. It screws it up with The Undertaker, it screws it up with Kurt Angle, and it screws it up with Eddie Guerrero. Because those three guys are over on SmackDown. Getting Goldberg over to take on those matches can happen. You know, they've done some inner promotional promotional matches during that time period, but that's that's another hurdle to try to get over. And also, with this scenario, we lose out on the cla- Even though we had a couple of other classics between them. We lose out on the classic WrestleMania 20 match between Eddie Guerrero and Kurt Angle. Which, in my opinion, and I've said this many times, is probably the greatest straight-up-and-down WWE title match in WrestleMania history. Straight-up-and-down. No other stipulations than two men in a title. Not an Iron Man match as a time limit stipulation. Not a hardcore match in four corners or three- triple threats or any other sort sort it's straight up and down one-on-one -on -one, mano we mano championship match and it's one of the absolute greatest in wrestlemania history right up there with savage and flair angle goldberg i i can appreciate that uh i can see angle maybe taking care of himself a little bit better than brett did especially after seeing what happened to brett and especially at that point Maybe Goldberg kind of learned his lesson a little bit and kind of dialed back on a lot of the stuff that he was doing. Not having him have a belt 
good option, but almost the entire reason, one of the major things that made Goldberg come over to WWE was he, I'm, the rumor was he put in a contract, he's going to win a belt. He's going to win the belt at least once in that year that he's there. That was in his contract he put in, I'm going to win the belt at least once while I'm there. So to have him not have the title, I kind of agree with, but, you know, it's in his contract. I don't think Goldberg would agree with it. Also, the other thing about him being a heel is this was an era on Raw. There weren't a whole lot of strong faces on Raw. There really weren't. In that entire reign of terror, Triple H made sure that the only strong face on Raw was his buddy Shawn Michaels and Goldberg because it was in his contract. And even then, he kind of weakened Goldberg a little bit in some of the shit that he did. Like, there were no strong... Scott Steiner came in and looked like shit. He kept every strong face fucking down during that entire reign of terror. Except... Except for his buddy Shawn Michaels, Goldberg because he had to, and his buddy Batista. That's it. So if you have Goldberg as a heel, you have a severely lopsided Raw roster. You, in that entire scenario, you must, 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 must build some strong faces. You must, you must invest in Chris Jericho as a face. You must invest in... Somebody else is a face. You must ditch that fucking stupid NWO angle and invest in another strong face or two or three to help strengthen the other side so that you can have some kind of some kind of balance. Even if Goldberg's just this monster coming in every other month and destroying people, you need to have some sort of balance in the meantime. And there really wasn't at that time period. I like a lot of what he said for me. The problem with what he said was the timing. The state of Raw, the state of the business, the state of Triple H's ego, all of that stuff. The state of uh, Kurt uh, of uh, Goldberg's contract, all that stuff. There are a couple ways this could have worked if Raw had built stronger faces. You know, if Undertaker, Eddie, and Angle weren't all on the SmackDown side. Although, again, you can kind of fix that with the interpromotional thing. He's trying to destroy all of WWE. But at the same time, as soon as it's seen that Eric Bischoff is trying to destroy all of WWE... Vince McMahon is going to come in and, and kick him in the nuts like he did quite a few times during that brand extension. So it, it's got to it's got to kind of be a balance. Maybe have Vince McMahon kind of pulling the strings like he did with the NW introducing the NWO. I don't know. The, there are a couple of different plot holes in that for me. Party people, what about for you? Are there any plot holes in that that you see? Do you agree with mine? Do you disagree with mine? You think that I'm I'm just some jabron who should shut the fuck up? Tell me down there, party people. Comment down there. Like, share, subscribe. YouTube.com slash surreal469. Little blue button right hand side. Click support. You'll be supporting. And buddy, that ain't bad. Boom. Boom. And boom.